Hi everyone, welcome back to Books and Beats. Today I'm going to be talking about Claudia Rankin, Citizen and American Lyric. Okay, so this book was published in 2014 and it has the copy that i have has 169 pages and if you want to listen to it on audible it'll be about one hour and 37 minutes to listen to it okay so i'm going to read the blurb and then get into the book itself you take in things you don't want all the time the second you hear or see some ordinary moment all its intended targets, all the meanings behind the retreating seconds, as far as you are able to see, come into focus. Hold up. Did you just hear? Did you just say? Did you just see? Did you just do that? Then the voice in your head silently tells you to take your foot off your throat because just getting along shouldn't be an ambition. okay so this book is i'm actually gonna slightly adjust this camera because i feel like there's a lot of glare okay i think that's a little bit better yeah that's a little bit better okay again as i usually tell you i live in new york city the neighborhood is alive and well it's halloween so there we go so there's a lot of extra sounds today okay so please bear with me i'm wearing earphones i'm hoping that that will offset some of the sounds great so i was introduced to this book when i was still studying at the new school i took a poetry class with um one of my lecturers there and it was a small class i think there were like eight of us maximum and i remember the first day of school my first class was um in that same room but with a different lecturer and one of my classmates because one of my biggest fears when i started studying was that i was going to be too old to be in university um, because i was 29 when i decided that okay i'm gonna go back and i think i had just turned 30 or was about to turn 30. no i was still 29 when i started studying so i had this fear of like oh, i'm not going to be relatable i'm not going to be able to like find my crew and everybody's going to be so much younger and then the very first day of class my first interaction was with a woman who was returning to academia just like i was and she was in her 70s so that taught me a lesson it's never too late and you're never the oldest one or the youngest one doing anything for the most part okay there's a few sprinkled few people here and there and for me that's something that actually makes me feel good um, about life that i'm just one of many people trying things for the first time in any case in my second semester we read this book in my poetry class and whoo did i not cry I cried. You know that cry where you have tears and mucus coming into your mouth? I cried like that reading this. Uh, I, I might have some black lipstick on my teeth every now and then, whatever. Um, but in any case, the thing about this book is that it is a collection of short stories, poetry, collage, visual art. It's like a concoction that's made of, of lots of different elements, including text and... Um, images and that was not by mistake obviously she did that so that um, we could be more immersed in the feeling element of the experiences that she relays and so how she put this book together from the interviews that i've heard and actually she came to uh, the new school that's where i was studying to give a lecture and i just remember being so like how is it that in my lifetime i got to be in the same room where she was giving a lecture while i was studying amazing um and in any case she was talking about how she collected these stories by asking people she knew, friends, family and otherwise, to tell, the, tell her stories of when they are just going through life, but they are then um, end up in a situation that racializes them. And I think this is something that if you're a black person of color, you understand. It's like you're just going about your day. You're just living life. You're just doing your thing. And then the next thing you know, bam, something happens. And it's like the world or the people around you. Are trying to remind you you are black and you're like ah, but i was just trying to buy bread <laughs> you know what i mean oh, i was just trying to go watch the baseball i was just trying to read a book in the park so things like that constantly happen um and this book does a very good job of expressing a lot of what 
I could say is the type of racism and discrimination that happens most often and that is microaggressions. There's a lot of microaggressions that have taken the place of overt racism. Now overt racism still happens. We still get these, we still hear stories um, of overt racism like obviously george floyd was like a huge moment like that michael brown was another one there's a lot there's a long list of people of color and black people specifically who have been murdered as a result of people's bias or fear towards black people or prejudices towards black people or quite honestly racism and so Yes, overt racism is something that definitely still happens and is quite prevalent, but microaggressions are the things that are now the things that we need to all band together and look out for and eradicate because it happens in the small moments of, can I touch your hair? Or like, where are you from? Those little things that people do that infer, it's not a direct statement, but they infer that you don't belong or you're somehow different. And the thing about touching your hair, I'm actually going to link to a, a lecture that uh, a woman made on t a TEDx talk that someone gave about how um, the history of touch, the reason why asking people to touch their hair or to touch their skin, I've literally had people, I had a person lick my skin because she, they, he wanted to know if I tasted different in the club, back in the day in Cape Town right and so at the time i was just like that was weird i didn't understand i didn't correlate at the time that this was a form of microaggression and also we, everyone was drinking so it was like just a weird thing that happened at night but in any case the history of touching people's uh, hair or like that type of like othering of the black body has a very painful history that dates back to um considering black people as zoo animals quite frankly like petting them so asking people to touch their hair is not okay um, and not only is it like an invasion of private space it's also got its history and its roots in something that you probably don't want to be a part of right so yeah the bottom line is that this book does a good job of um, dropping you into microaggressive moments that take place and that happen for people. There's two stories that I distinctly remember from here and I promise by telling you this, I, I don't think that I'm spoiling the book for you because I generally don't like doing this, but I think it's important. There was one, okay, I'll share one. There's one story of a guy who is picking up his friend's kids from school and he's, you know, coming to the house to drop them off. And as he's in the front yard, the neighbors call the cops because he's in the front yard of this house and the neighbors are like, they thought that he was a burglar or something like that. And he's like, I'm dropping off my friend's kids home. You know, what made you think that I was a burglar? I wasn't like jamming the doors. I wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary, you know? So stories like that. Um, she also di uh, did a lecture uh, where she spoke about part of the the reasoning behind why she used images and text in this uh, book. And she says... The, 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 the place where she gave the lecture or the presentation was the International Festival of Art and Ideas. I think it takes place in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'll also give you a link to that. It's an hour-long um, lecture slash presentation, and I would urge you strongly to watch it. It is very enlightening, and I think it also, yes, it takes, you know, gets, gives you a look behind the curtain, but if you're someone who's interested in writing or further understanding um, the imagery that was used in the book, it would be valuable. So she says, the use of images in Citizen is meant in part to destabilize the text. So both image and text would always have possibilities, both realized and unimagined by me, beyond my curating powers. Consequently, I wanted to create an aesthetic form for myself where the text was trembling. I was interested in how the dynamic of intertextuality differently energizes a text, this resonates in part because I feel that the entrance of the black body works like that in the American landscape. You can have a seemingly predictable conversation on the phone and then you enter the room and your image derails expectations of public decorum and decency. And then she goes on to talk about how the concepts of normal, um, why we have very specific ideas around what normal is and why it is that black bodies fall outside of the norm even though we've existed for <laughs> centuries at this point okay um and yeah i mean i feel like this is a very good 
some i'm gonna stop it here and i want to just talk a little bit about like who i think this book is um directed at and this is a, a long conversation we had in our poetry class um and you know my my answer changes depending on where i'm at in my own personal journey when it comes to you know uh, racism and how systemic racism and how the world receives my body um and or me as a result of my body and how i look and where i come from and i think that in in one way it's definitely a book that exists for people who experience these types of racist microaggressions to know that there are others who are having this experience and to have a book that reflects back to you that mirrors back to you hey you are not losing your mind you're not imagining things these things have happened not just to you and yes this is how it feels and i think there's something powerful about being able to put words and feelings um, to something that is so subtle like a microaggression right so that's there's there's one element of that and for me it was useful at the time that i read it to serve that purpose of going oh my gosh i'm not the only one cool and then the other side of it i think is to educate or to give uh, an an inner glimpse a closer glimpse or look for people who might not experience my racist microaggressions to understand the impact and to understand what they look like excuse me and feel like at the time because they really oftentimes reduce you they reduce the person who's on the receiving end of them so for microaggressors potential microaggressors people who are not black people who are not people of color who don't ex experience racist microaggressions this book is for you okay as well and i mean i cannot give you the definitive answer to that i think that um claudia is someone who wrote this book because she wanted to say what she was observing and then from there it's up to us to decide who wants to pick that up or not right and this and like she says in the pbs interview that i'm going to link to here as well um is that she believes that the that she is just another writer just like james baldwin was a writer um Tom Mar Tommy, tony morrison um uh, w.e.b dubois was were all people who were talking about what was happening in life at that time right and i think that she just sees herself as just another writer who's doing that for this time and the interesting thing sad thing unfortunate surprising shocking insert a word you want to put here is that this book was published in 2014 around the time that it was published michael um brown was killed around that time um and obviously there was a big uprising in that moment but this book is still relevant today like you you read the stories in here and you're like yeah sounds about right um and i know that it's an american lyric and it specifically speaks to the uh, black american experience um or african american experience but i can say that i recognize a lot of those situations a lot of those scenarios because i come from south africa and of course very different context but very similar outward playing or displaying of these experiences i'll cap it there i highly recommend this book every time i'm asked what book i recommend people read whenever it's random if i if you wake me up from my sleep and say recommend me a book to read this is the book that i recommend for people to read it's excellent it's well done it's thoughtful it's um emotional and i do recommend taking your time reading it um and maybe reading it twice because some things that jump up that don't jump out at you the first time will in a sec upon second reading okay now we are on to the book community spotlight for this week the book community spotlight is a podcast that is run by someone i admire a lot jennifer baker or jen baker uh, based in new york city and i'll read the blurb minorities in publishing is the brainchild of publishing professional jen baker minorities in publishing mip is a podcast discussing diversity or lack thereof in the book in the book publishing industry with other professionals working in-house as well as authors and those in the literary scene mip is an interview format podcast where jennifer discusses the lack of diversity in the book publishing industry with other underrepresented professionals working in or associated with the literary scene featured guests include vice presidents and executive editors literary agents marketers authors illustrators and more the podcast began in august 2014 and posts new episodes every month i think it's actually bi-monthly now with a new 
guest. In addition to talking about the greater systemic issues of marginalized representation in media, we also discuss guests' personal experiences in their respective field, as well as provide information of what to expect as an emerging writer or professional in this business. You can find podcast episodes on iTunes, Google, iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and I'm sure more as well, right? Um, and yeah, I met Jen years ago now, probably four or three years ago. Um, she came, she was a speaker on a panel that one of my lecturers had organized. And I remember just being so in awe at how vibrant, um, authentic, honest, um, but also oddly approachable she was and um, after seeing her speak a second time I was like okay I'm going to this panel again and I'm going to speak to her so I think I wrote her an email and then I walked up to her at the panel trembling and I was like hi I'm Didi I wrote to you I was so nervous to speak to you the first time and she was like why would you be nervous I'm so glad you came to say hi and she was just like so open she's like I'm glad you emailed me and yeah, just reach out to me if you ever need anything or if you want to talk about specific things. And I was just like, oh my gosh, yeah, thank you. Ah, gushing, you know, um, and, and tripping over myself. But it just was so refreshing to be in a literary space and talking to someone who also uh, studied at the new school who is deeply embedded in the um, literary scene in New York City and who is doing incredible work. There's actually one of the uh, books that she published, um, that she edited. I'm... I'll put a picture here because I can't find the book now. I've got a whole lot of books over here that I uh, took from up there and I'm going to put them on my bookshelf. But in any case, all of that to say that Jennifer is incredible and her podcast is enlightening. And I think the thing to me that is the most powerful thing about the podcast is that it doesn't only, she doesn't only speak to um, authors. She also speaks to editors, marketers. So you really get to speak to people who are in the business in the creative writing, in the literary business. And there's something very important about that because yes, while it is wonderful to hear from authors, it's also great to hear from somebody who illustrated a book cover or somebody who edited books to hear like, what is it that they're looking for in like an editor, author relationship what kinds of books are they looking for what kind of tips can they give um, and also just people who do the marketing side of things like how is that process how does that go how can you prepare yourself to be attractive to a publishing house for instance so yeah fascinating interesting and she's also just a wonderful personality please give it a listen if you have a chance i'll put her twitter her um her details down there and also obviously links to the podcast Okay, so the mixtape of the week is Something Brown. It is a mix that was done on Globalize, Globalize Yourself Stereo. And I would describe this playlist or this mixtape um, as a beautiful, jazzy, soulful stroll on a Sunday afternoon that then turns into a sunset stroll. It's beautiful. It's an easy listen. It's a wonderful listen. And I say Sunday, please do not associate this with, you know, those melancholic Sundays. Like for me growing up, Sunday always used to feel like, ah, tomorrow's school, especially with because we used to get these chores like yo these chores like yeah you gotta polish your sh school shoes iron your clothes make them ready for school and i'm like i am here today why do i need to be doing stuff for tomorrow leave me alone you know and i just feel like sundays was not my favorite day now it's different i actually really love sundays but in any case when i say it's a sunday afternoon kind of podcast um mixtape it's more a positive sunday the kind of sunday you want to have the kind of sundays the childhood version of yourself or at least the childhood version of myself was like when i grow older this is how my sundays are going to look not like this crap <laughs> okay so yeah it's in the it's in the links at the bottom definitely give it a listen and enjoy it's it's truly lovely Okay, reflections. Um, so I am feeling so good. I woke up from the most beautiful dream and I've just been kind of sitting in that dream feeling the whole day. Um, and I'm feeling very positive and inspired and excited about life. I'm also feeling rather bold because I've had this black lipstick for a long time and I just have not ever really worn it. Um, and today I decided to wear it. It's got nothing to do with the fact that it's Halloween. It just felt like today I feel 
confident enough to be bold enough to wear the black lipstick and i think it works it works really well with these earrings and this white sweater i think they call it a sweater like i said and i don't know these names of sweater cardigan jersey all the difference i would call this a jersey yeah but in any case i feel great i feel you i hope you feel great as well and i hope this episode gave you something and i hope you come back next week i will be talking about steve beagle's i write what i like mm -hmm. powerful book and um the following week after that i'll be talking about ben okri i can actually show you these books i've got them here i told you i'm gonna get more prepared preparation is my best friend planning my best friend um, so Steve Biko is coming up next week. The following week after that is going to be Ben Okri, A Way of Being Free. Woo, this book, powerful. And then after that, I'm going to be talking about A Small Revolution by Jimin Han. So yeah, that's what you can look forward to on the horizon. I hope you're doing well and I hope you have a wonderful day further. Goodbye.